Good morning. Welcome to the Tech Ranch. Welcome to Monday. This is Captain Cybernet John Nagel sitting in for the one, the only, and potentially infamous guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. Joining me today in studio is another individual who not only remembers what a five and a quarter inch floppy is, but actually used them. And my co host today, the tech geezer, Jim Walsh. What about that, Jim? You still remember those old days? Uh, maybe even the eight inch floppy? Oh, yeah. Bringing you back a little bit, right? Yeah. So uh, we have a jam-packed lineup here today. Not only that, we have our studio full of some uh, pretty important guests today. We're joining us today will be Justin Glaser from the North Dakota Automated Vehicle Collaborative, Jerry Ketterling, a certified information security specialist with CyberNet Security LLC, and calling in a little bit uh, or later this morning will be Claude Brooks to talk about the best apps for parents and their kids. So let's kick this off here with Justin Glaser from the North Dakota Automated Vehicle Collaborative. Welcome, Justin. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Say, we want to talk a little bit today about this uh, wonderful event that occurred last week uh, called the AC 1.0 Roundtable Discussion and Social. Can you fill us in a little bit on what happened uh, last week at the University of Mary? Yes. Yeah, so last week we, uh, we put together a, a small little summit of sorts out at the University of Mary on the 23rd. Uh, we had uh, industry professionals from around the state of North Dakota that uh, attended uh, this this conference. Uh, it was a very detailed conference. We touched on uh, areas of transportation, ag and manufacturing, construction, mining and energy, education, cybersecurity, and infrastructure as it pertains to autonomous systems, whether that's unmanned ground systems or unmanned aerial systems. Sounds like an interesting day. Did you have a significant amount of people there? Yeah, we had 35 to 40 industry professionals that that we sought out and specifically invited to come to this event to to discuss the the challenges that they're facing in their industry as it pertains to autonomous systems and then ultimately networking and what business opportunities can we develop as if we start coming together and start talking about this technology and where can North Dakota capitalize on it. So this was a little bit different approach I hear that was taken instead of you know bringing the government in and state local federal and and them telling um, us what we need as business people this was an opportunity for business people to get together talk about their visions their needs to actually start to automate whether that's on the factory floor vehicles or in the air. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Um, we had some bullet points that uh, we wanted to touch on in those specific areas that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was we wanted to hear from our industry professionals that were sitting in, in the room. It wasn't so much about <clears throat> us going up and lecturing, per se, about what we think the challenges are. We wanted to hear from the industry what their challenges really are and what can we do to help them. Well, what were some of the challenges that they were talking about for them to, to move into this automated vehicle space or automated uh, aerial space? Well, one of the big big challenges is going to be, as with any, any change, it is regulation and how do we do that in a smart and, and sensible manner that's safe and it's, and it's efficient. Um, you know, in the transportation sector, a, a, a huge thing, you've probably heard it on this show before, is hours of service for drivers. They can only be on so many hours a day and have to shut down. And probably the biggest thing that was brought up is the lack of drivers and qualified drivers. And that trend is only going to continue to get worse. So we've got, we, we've, we've got a real problem there and we need to get a ha handle on it. And when you talk about that, too, it's not that as if you're a, a truck driver of some type of vehicle size and the money that you make there is actually significant money. Some of these jobs are paying up to six figures, and we still can't fill forty or 50,000 open positions out there today. The other thing that's interesting that um, I'd like to talk a little bit about today is the actual acceptance of automated vehicles. And will people use them? Who's using them today? Do we think that the adoption will be delayed just because people are afraid? And what do you think we can do about that to get them on board? Quite honestly, if it's not the most critical piece as it pertains to autonomous system, it's certainly right there up there. And that is education from the, from the public 
sector about the capabilities of this technology, what it can do and, w- and what it can't do. That it, it is absolutely going to be critical for it because, I mean, Reuters just came out yesterday um, with a poll and says that two-thirds of the general public are not comfortable with this technology to ride in a, an autonomous bus or an autonomous vehicle or an autonomous truck or be integrating with those systems because it's not going to be, you know, all of a sudden one day just everything's going to be autonomous. I mean, there's going to be a transition phase where we're still going to be behind the wheel as a human actually controlling that vehicle and integrating with these autonomous systems. So when we talk about autonomy, there's different levels of it. To to help the audience understand a little bit about what we're talking about here, um, I think it was Doosan and a gentleman from Doosan Bobcat that actually put it in plain English for us. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he he had a very very interesting way of looking at it, and it, and it simplifies it very well, I believe. You've got feet off, hands off, eyes off, and mind off are, are your levels of, of thinking in autonomy. Um, feet off is obviously is pretty basic. We all have that today with cruise control and that sort of stuff. Hands off, there's some of that, depending on uh, what type of automobile, like Cadillac's got it. If you've got park assist where you can take your hands off the wheel and it'll actually park the vehicle, that would be that. Now eyes off, that's that's totally different. That could be where you're responding to an email message or whatever and the car continues to drive itself down the road, but you are still somewhat engaged in the driving activity. Now, mind off is you could be working on your spreadsheet for your next financial presentation on your way to Fargo, and you are completely disengaged from the driving activity. Yeah, that's where the, the production piece come, or excuse me, the productivity piece and efficiency piece comes into play. That'll be a little bit of a journey till we get there. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about here a little bit today is they're, they're talking about bringing an autonomous bus here to Bismarck, North Dakota. And I know that the mayor has been involved. I'm sure the governor will be. And hopefully the, the uh, city commission will get on board and we'll find the right funding it for it here in Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, the, uh, the, the general public will get a chance to experience this uh, live in real time and hopefully help them overcome their fears here a little bit. Um, last but not least here, um, just to give you an idea how far this technology could go, Ford has recently patented... Um, uh, Jerry, the autonomous police car, John. Yeah, so we talk Are we about ready for the RoboCop. <laughs> yeah, so RoboCop is starting to become reality here, and and we'll um, so stay tuned for everything autonomous coming at you. Welcome back to the Tech Ranch. This is Captain Cybernet John Nagel coming back at you here for round two today. Joining us here uh, will be Claude Brooks, who is going to chat a little bit about us with uh, the best apps for parents. Claude is, no, or Claude is known for Hip Hop Mary, an Emmy-nominated uh, program for a 4- to 10-year-old age group. Claude, uh, well, Claude, welcome to the show. Oh, good to, good to be here. Thanks, John. How you guys doing over there? We're doing well. Staying uh, actually quite warm day up here in the Upper Great Plains. So uh, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to uh, your insight and wisdom as we talk about some of the best apps for parents and kids. And with that, could you tell us a little bit, uh, first of all, about yourself and Hip Hop Harry, and then we'll, we'll get right into the apps for parents and kids. Sure, sure. So I'm a, uh, a television producer, and I, my company is uh, C to the B Productions, and we've done over 300 episodes of television. A lot of, like, sitcoms, like Second Time Around, Hits, and Dan 360. And, and during, that, during that journey, which is more kind of like adult-related stuff, um, I put together a show called Hip Hop Harry, and that was birthed out of doing, um, trying to help my, my nephews with their, with their homework, and they couldn't catch on at all. And, and so I started just freestyle rapping the concept to them, and they caught on immediately. And I'm like, whoa, what if we had a character similar to, like, you know, a Barney-type show that uh, taught kids using rhyming to, to help push the message? And the more research I did on this, John, is I realized that rhyming is just like Cat in the Hat. Right, we we never thought of that, but Cat in the Hat is just like is rapping, and and so rhyming's a precursor for literacy, and and uh, hence Hip Hop Harry was born, and we were on a we were on Discovery Kids for five years, and during that time we got nominated 
for an Emmy, Emmy and won a, a few Parents' Choice Awards. And, and uh, you know, it's just, been, it's just been a great kind of gift that continues to, to, uh, to give back. And now, now that I have a three-year-old daughter myself, uh, we're making, you know, we're making new content, and we've moved off of Discovery Kids. Went away a few years back, and so now we're on a bunch of digital uh, platforms. So, and, and and being on a lot of digital platforms, I, I do. I I'm ready to kind of talk to you uh, about that. Now that Hip Hop Harry is on, you know, we're, we're on YouTube, YouTube Kids, Roku, Play Kids, uh, you know, uh, just uh, Amazon, a, a, a plethora of them. Uh, so I really, I'm really, was really interested in talking to you guys just about those type of apps and and and, and what kind of sets them apart, what parents, parents and just uncles and aunts and and everything should should look out for. When we talk about, you know, uh, Claude, when we talk about the apps for parents and kids today, one of the the things that's a, a little bit terrifying for everybody, the kids seem to know more than the parents do about these apps and uh, presents a real challenge for the parents today and, and want to identify what the apps are using, how are they being used, and are the kids safe using them today, and, and are they learning in the right way and learning the right things? Um, when we talk about those apps, what are you seeing out there today? So what I'm seeing specifically for and kids, kids as young as two years old know how to navigate through their parents' phone almost better than their parents do <laughs> so that you, you hit that you hit that right right on right on the head um what what parents and just people in general should just kind of be aware aware of kids generally especially from the age group of four to four to kind of like 10 they're not going to go to an app unless you have it on on your tablet or phone or they have kind of like access access to it so that's that's kind of first first and foremost and then finding apps that have some type of real learning component is really important. One of, the, one of the things that has changed from when we were younger is now parents are using their phones and tablets. That's how kids are getting this information more than any other, you know, more than any other way. And, and parents are actually using these phones to, to be some form of a babysitter from time to time, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if the kids are watching something that can be interesting. Educational first and ed- entertaining, you know, kind of, kind of second, right? Because you want to be able to put your phone in front of, in front of your, your, your kid and go, okay, watch this, and, and, you, and you can run off and make dinner or get ready or do whatever you, you kind, of, kind of need to do. So it is a functional thing. It's not, it's not, it's not negative. It's, it's functional if you know how to use it the right way. And that's, so, a, you know, that's a key point, Cloud, is, is, is how do you use that app? How do you know which is the right app? Are they getting it from a trusted source? Um, who are the experts should they trust? You know, some of the other questions that come to my mind are, you know, does the app protect your child's privacy? And is the app right for your child's age? Those, those are things that all need to be considered by parents. But out there in these wild, wild west app stores, the, you know, the kids can look, download pretty much anything they want at any time they want without even the parents even knowing they've done that. So, you know, what are some of the things that, that parents can do to make sure their, their children are using the right apps and using them the right way? So I think there's two kind of segments to look at here. It's the kids who are who are like under you know ten or even under eight or so, those those parents really have a have a better source of control because those those type, those kids at that age range aren't necessarily pulling down, going to the app store and pulling down stuff themselves, right? Right. The parent actually has to kind of take the lead lead on it. The the other part is whatever you may have on your phone or tablet as a parent, the kid can get into as well. So if you have YouTube for example, on, on your phone, which is a great, which can be a great app for kids as well. But the issue is you don't go, go into YouTube and maybe set up some kind of restrictions or, or actually set a playlist specifically that you want your, your child to watch. That, that works. The issue is at any point that you maybe walk away from your phone if you're on YouTube and your kid just goes in and starts hitting buttons, they can end up anywhere within, within YouTube and, and, and generally, it's, with, it's the history of whatever has been watched by their parents. So, you know, if Daddy happened to be watching wet T-shirt contest. Guess what? There's a good chance that little <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the little baby can end up right there too and be like, "Whoa, what's going on?" Right. So the way to kind of go ahead. The way to safeguard it. I don't mean to cut you off there, Daddy, but the way to 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 to, to, to safeguard against YouTube specifically for kids under the ten year old, um, you know, age is. Get the app called YouTube Kids, so it gives you 
access to only kid-related content on YouTube. So they start playing around in it. They're still staying in the world of, of, of YouTube kids, and you can actually set parameters on there. I want them to watch, you know, from the four to six range or, or whatever. So YouTube Kids is a great app, you know, for that. We, we get a lot of views on YouTube Kids as well as YouTube Regular. You know, we get over 500,000 views a day throughout different platforms, so we've learned a little bit about this, this world, you know, by doing Hip Hop Harry. You know, and we talk about not, you know, you, sp you spoke briefly about, you know, the kids using their parents' phone. Um, is there anything parents can do to actually lock their phone? We've heard about some terms thrown around like screen pinning on Android devices where the child can use that app but can't get to anything else. What do you recommend for parents to do to their phone so when you hand them that phone, whether they're, you know, you want to, them to use it a distraction or maybe a temporary babysitter while you're trying to do something, what do you recommend for parents to do to those phones to just lock them into that one app? So since the technology is constantly changing, Changing and what you just brought up—the screen pinning—I've heard of that before. Unfortunately, I'm not on Android. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a you know iPhone person. But one of one of the things uh, that parents can do to just stay kind of on top of what's going on is just Google what is the best way to safeguard against. You know, I have a child this age range. What's the base, best way to safeguard? Uh, you know, against predatory type apps or or anything like that. Um, and you constantly, if you're checking in on that, even if you're just doing it, you know, every couple of months, Google Google is one of the best sources around. As well as going to YouTube and typing in those same type of keywords, you'll see a lot of a lot of videos, and you can then discern and figure out which what information fits you, you know, kind of kind of best. Um, but if you start if you start if you start your child off kind of early in saying, hey, these are these are the ones that you're able to watch, then that's that's good. As you get a little bit older into into your kids who are you know ten and older and becoming preteens and teens, it becomes a little bit more difficult to monitor what they're doing, but not in, in that you can actually literally unlock their phone, make sure they don't have a password on there that that you can't get through, you know, and if, and if that's an issue, then you have to take away their phone, right? You have to, you have to set, you have to set boundaries. So you do need to kind of go in and just, you know, search through their phone from time to time and see what they've been up to. You know, when you, that, that's a great point. You know, parents need to learn the applications, the technology, and the platforms that their kids are using today. It's not good enough anymore just to actually hand them a device, whether it's an iPad or another tablet or even your phone. You need to know how it functions. And it's so important because children today trust people and the personas you meet literally through these applications might not be another child. It could be anybody or anyone. And you never know who you're talking to. You also have to be aware of your child's privacy, and they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be doing putting their ages out there or any personal identifying information. So you have to help your children protect themselves a little bit. And there's different apps out there that actually do that, that you know, literally help you or help the technology or the operating system uh, do that for the parent here today too. Right, um, right, and, it's, and that and that talks that speaks to you know kids as they start getting past the like nine, eight, nine year old age. Because then they're they're trying to get into apps where they're you know they're they're so social media related right where they're actually being social with other with other people and they need to be a hundred percent clear on what you, what you're saying and you can even play, have like a little role play thing with them hey if you happen to log on what are we going to do if they ask for this what do you say and all that information is really important one one of the things folks are doing is they're looking for you know trying to get. Lure, lure kids in, not just for predatory stuff that we think of, right, with the dark, dark web, but they're also just trying to get their first and last name. And with that information, you know, some hackers, that can be enough for them to figure out, okay, now let's get to their Social Security number. Because they know they have this gap of time where no one's ever going to figure out that your credit is ruined and it's been used for stuff. You got to, you know, when you take it from a 10-year-old, you have about seven years before that would ever even pop up by then yep. it's, it's completely it's completely done exactly. so that's really kind of important to say hey don't ever give your you know complete name name out or maybe even come up with a nickname that you use on on uh if you are allowing them to go to social sites 
Yes, and, and, and the other key thing, too, you got to watch out there for parents today is you literally have to watch out for the apps that look free, and they're not, and children are actually able to buy things or purchase items. You could run one heck of a bill up for the, your uh, parents and their cell phone bill. Uh, so we want to stay, uh, stay aware of that. Uh, Claude Brooks, thank you from Hip Hop Harry for joining us today on the Tech Ranch. Have a great day. Welcome back to round three of the Tech Ranch. This is Captain Cybernet John Nagel coming back at you here. We've got a fascinating topic for our audiences today, and it's one that I think uh, is very confusing for the majority of people out there, including those that are experts. Uh, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency or digital currency. Uh, Crypto meaning digital encryption and currency meaning a system of money. And joining me for this conversation will be Jerry Ketterling, a cybersecurity expert with uh, CyberNet Security. Welcome, Jerry. What, John? I don't get a, a, a name? No, no name, no moniker. It's No Moniker Monday oh, no today, moniker so Monday. No Moniker Monday. We'll have to work on that, John. I think I, need, I think I need a name, Captain Crypto or something like that. Well, let's just go with that for now. But All remember, right. No Moniker Monday today. You so, so when we talk about uh, cryptocurrency or digital currency, people have the perception it really kind of started with Bitcoin. Everybody talks about Bitcoin. But the history of crypto really began, what, in about the mid or early 1990s? And um, there was a group of people out there, and for some reason, you know, when we talk about to the techies or everything starts out, you know, and hey, Ashbury in the 60s, this was really a San Francisco-based, um, you know, group of people called the cypherpunks. Cypherpunks, uh, yeah. Yep, cypherpunks. And just for you out there, some of those people actually included, um, you know, Phil Zimmerman, Hal Finning, the guys that founded PGP. Uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the founder of Bitcoin, and one that everybody knows that was part of that early group was Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. So, um, so when we talk about cryptocurrency here, it it actually did take in, and have its founding uh, days in uh, the mid '90s, and um, actually would have really taken off, I think, if it would have wouldn't have been for a couple hiccups there when. Um, uh, DigiCash was going to be picked up by Deutsche Bank, but uh, for some reason, uh, it just didn't quite make it, whether it was regulation or people didn't understand what it was. But uh, we can fast forward a little bit here, and, and Jerry, this is where we really want to spend our time, is really around on Bitcoin. And Bitcoin itself really launched, uh, what, January 2009, sometime in that time frame? Yeah, Bitcoin got its, <clears throat> its official launch in 2009. However, it all started with a white paper that was issued in 2008. And in that white paper, the author of the white paper um, actually laid out the concept of Bitcoin. And from there, it just kind of grew. And it was 2009 when they actually launched. Now, so what's, what's interesting, right, about digital currency when you talk about it in, in cryptocurrency is the launch of this paper and the launch of Bitcoin seem to coincide a little bit with the downfall of Lehman Brothers, too. I mean, just talk yeah. about irony there. there was, it was not irony, as a matter of fact. The entire concept of cryptocurrency was really a reaction by the technology groups to essentially add stability to the chaos that our current geopolitical and, and financial systems and banking systems are offering us worldwide. Uh, for example, banks typically, banks typically fail on a cycle. And on that cycle, during that failure, government rushes in, props up the banks, passes on the money through quantitative easing, uh, investment easing, and that's passed on to us as inflation. And that hyperinflation is where you really can understand the value of cryptocurrency. You talk about developing nations where you have this hyperinflation where a buck is really like worth $1 trillion bill, which doesn't buy you really anything. And uh, Bitcoin or the crypto coins out there actually help uh, stabilize that whole environment. Uh, That's correct. You may look at you know countries like Venezuela right now. <clears throat> Venezuela's um, current projected uh, inflation rate is in four digits. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty staggering when you think about that. I right? can't even imagine uh, what that must be like. Yeah, I can't we, imagine what we the haven't, interest we rates haven't will be. seen inflation in our country past what about two and a half, four percent. For a long time. Yeah, can you imagine back in the days when we had 15 and 19 percent uh, home loans? It, it, it just is unfathomable. I do remember the the, the 15 percent home loans, and perhaps we'll see those come back if we follow the route that Venezuela went down, which, oddly enough, did start with quantitative easing. <laughs> right. So let's let's talk a little bit about what is the engine behind Bitcoin and why Bitcoin. And in and of itself is, is so different than our current system. 
When we talk mm-hmm. about Bitcoin or the blockchain behind it, you can think of re- really our money system as a ledger-based system. Yeah. And right, and, and the major differences in, the, in this ledger-based system when we start talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, et cetera, it's really a distributed ledger. That's all it does is keep track of who bought what and when. That's exactly right. And I think if you go back to the foundation of currencies, all, all currencies, <laughs> in the beginning of time, I guess we started with rocks and precious gems. Those are things we could carry around and collect and we could trade for a certain amount of implied value. Uh, at some point in time, we decided to go along the lines of gold and silver, um, the, the metal-based. And most governments followed um, backing their currency with actual metals. And if you look at the United States, we used to be on the gold standard, uh, which meant that for every bank note, a dollar bill that is issued in in circulation, the bank was required to to hold in reserve an equal amount of gold. So the original system was a one-for-one mapping where a dollar bill was equal to a dollar's worth of gold. That quickly went down the toilet, so to speak. Because bankers found out that, well, why should I hold a whole dollar's worth of gold when I can leverage it and hold just one-tenth of gold? And so then we eventually had our first banking collapse, which then brought in the Federal Reserve. Right. Federal Reserve yeah. came in board, and it was the banker's last resort. So the bank would get their loan from the, from the Federal Reserve. So Federal remember- Reserve was supposed to hold that, that gold in reserve. Yeah, but then Nixon closed the gold window, right? He did, 1972, I believe it was. Uh, 71 or 72. 71, maybe, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right about that time. Yeah. So so let's fast forward here a little bit, all right? And, and um, just to give a, a little bit better understanding what uh, this whole bit blockchain, Bitcoin thing is. So we talked about it being a distributed ledger. ledger. We also talked about it being not in one place. It's not centralized like a centralized bank. It's really distributed on computers on a mesh network. Yeah. No single point of pa- failure, right? Right. And uh, there's well, no. John, John, you know as well as I, since we're both in the cybersecurity space here, cybernet security, <laughs> banks are a central point of failure electronically for us, right? So you know we can get into electronics via uh, via you know various hacking hacking tools that we have at our disposal and. Unfortunately, a lot of nefarious folks, unlike us, out there have those same tools at their disposal. So they attack the central point. In blockchain, there is no central point. It's the equivalent of each and every one of us who carries a wallet, a blockchain wallet, or has a block, a full implementation of the blockchain running. Um, you have a full copy of every transaction that has ever occurred on that blockchain. So therefore, in theory, under Armageddon, the entire world or half of the world is, is destroyed and all those computers are destroyed with it. It only takes one computer to survive and reseed the blockchain and bring it back to life. So, in, so wiping it out is virtually mathematically impossible. And, and that's what people have to understand. I know it's a new technology and there are challenges around uh, blockchain. There's challenges around cryptocurrency. And, and yeah, we do need regulation, but we need the right type of regulation. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in the show here. But, you know, the one thing when we talk about blockchain and we talk about Bitcoin, what does that mean for an individual? It's got to be a little terrifying to know that, hey, I can pull out, you know, a dollar out of my wallet and I got a <laughs> dollar in my hand. You know, that that's cool. I can see it. I can feel it. I can touch it. But uh, when we talk about a Bitcoin wallet, there is no wallet in my pocket. It sits out there in virtual space and there's virtual money in there. And what do I do with it? How do I get it? How do I use it a little bit? So it's very uncomfortable for an individual, yet alone businesses that have to rely on these transactions. Can you, you know, talk a little bit about not only the wallet and and how the, the coins get in there and then maybe talk about a vault, et cetera and that this money really doesn't disappear. Maybe equate the wallet to kind of like a checking and savings account for us. That's a great example. So as a segue in here, I'm going to introduce that. There is some insecurities we hear about on the news all the time. The news always likes to put Bitcoin out there. There's two types of news that that they like to put out about Bitcoin. How high it's getting, pumping it up, getting everybody excited. By the way, in December, it hit $20,000 per coin. It's currently today trading at $11,000 per coin. So it's highly volatile. Uh, the, the second area they like to, like to really let us know about is every failure that ever happens. 
right? Right. It, it, so it gets pretty scary, it, some of those pretty failures. scary. Forms. I mean, just uh, two days ago, we had a major failure in Japan, and that particular exchange was hacked. Um, no, the Bitcoin structure itself was not hacked. The blockchain was not hacked, but the interface to it was hacked, and approximately a half a million dollars worth of coins disappeared. So that's what gets really scary. You know, I'm not a yeah. guy with a half a million dollars, or five hundred million dollars, or half a billion dollars in the bank. But for an average in individual who wants to participate in Bitcoin or actually get into the digital currency, because it's going to be what's going to happen in the future, one way or another. Um, what are some things that they could actually do to to start to get into this a little bit, Jerry? Yeah, there, there's really two ways to get into Bitcoin. Number one, if you want to trade the coin directly, and by the way, there are well over 200 types of coins that qualify as currency now. Um, some people say it'll grow by, by that to well over 2,000. Um, you're going to download a wallet, and you're going to run that wallet on a computer at home, or you're going to run that wallet on, an, on, on your iPhone or your, or your Android device. Now, obviously, the wallet is our concern. You want to be sure you secure that wallet with a very hard password because that is your that is the way the hackers get in. We'll talk about uh, how to hard a password for that wallet here coming up here in the next segment or round four. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we'll be getting a little bit more into the details of Bitcoin uh, with Jerry Ketterling, uh, cybersecurity expert. Uh, stay tuned to the Tech Ranch. Right now, 7 above. Here's Sean Hannity. Weekday afternoons on Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Tech Ranch for round three with Captain Cybernet John Nagel. And we're going to continue our discussion about the Bitcoin wallet as in see if we can equate it to uh, savings and checking account here with Jerry Ketterling. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah. So there's really kind of a, a, a school of thought on wallets. <clears throat> Consider the fact that we all are used to having a bank account, and we typically mostly have a savings account and a checking account, and they're tied together at the central bank. Now, it wouldn't be wise for me to go down the road carrying, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in my wallet. So for best practices, I keep that in my savings account. And I just draw out through the ATM, you know, 100 bucks or so that is spending cash to keep in my wallet. So in the cryptocurrency world, we can do the same thing. There are vaults. Specifically, the one I like is in Switzerland. It's Zappo, X-A-P-O. It's uh, actually built in a military bunker underground. So we're talking a real vault here, not like something kept in your house in a little box that you can somebody can carry out. This is the real deal, right? This is the real deal. This, this is where the serious money meets the road and where your whales have come in and they have built these things to protect um, wealth. Essentially, Bitcoin is being looked upon as a wealth transference vehicle. Okay, so our wallet, our electronic wallet that we're carrying around with us, we should only withdraw from our vault occasionally what we need. Is that not how we use an yeah, ATM today? Yeah, or, or transfer money from savings to checking, right, to, to pay a few bills and have a little bit of cash with us. Exactly. Speaking of ATMs, if you want to invest in Bitcoin, that's another way you can do it. There are ATM machines, especially on the West Coast, that you can use to actually buy Bitcoin on the fly, right then and there with your bank card. You know, that's an interesting topic. We'll take a little uh, <laughs> left-hand turn here uh, for everybody <laughs> out there. Uh, where can you use Bitcoin? Is it something I can actually use? I know there had been a, a show where somebody uh, went out there and they filmed it and and they, the guy went and lived on Bitcoin for 30 days. He found it possible, but a little bit challenging and difficult. So where are some of the places you could actually use Bitcoin today? I mean, I know there's some restaurants. I know there's some ATMs out there and, and a few other places, but it's not really widely distributed for regular a regular person's use today. Is that sound yeah, bad? Well, that depends on what country you live in. Now, have, if you were living in Japan, Japan has passed a law that Bitcoin is considered a Japanese currency now. And so some, com some companies are now paying their employees a percentage of their salary in cash and in Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm not so sure I would like that. I don't think it would go over too well here in the States when you talk about a fluctuating paycheck. I mean, it fluctuates based on the hours we work maybe or our raises, but to fluctuate uh, the way uh, Bitcoin does today, I get paid 100 bucks. tomorrow it's worth 200 the next day it's worth 50 Ah, uh, Very good point. Now, I think that's our return on investment structure in the United States is based on a three to five year ROI. 
the return in most Asian companies is what? 7 to 10. So they look at things with a long term. We tend to look at things in the short term. And I see this daily on the financial trade markets. Yeah, it's, but when you think about that too, right? Uh, we see it in the financial trade markets. That's the Wall Street guys. You know, those are the guys that control all the money flow or the central banks, et cetera. We can talk about that. But for the average consumer, I know there's five bucks in my wallet. I got five bucks. I can touch it, see it, and feel it, right? Yeah. So I don't have to worry about it going up and down or long term. I, you know, the five bucks might not be in my wallet long term, but at least I know it's five bucks in my wallet. Now, you didn't lose that Bitcoin. Its value may have gone down, just like the dollar value can fluctuate too. It may go down. You didn't lose the dollar. But the value and the buying power of it might change on a daily basis. So what we're really talking about is the um, propensity of Bitcoin's value to fluctuate more than the dollar. Okay, Over time, that will be worked out. That, that is going to stabilize. And they actually just started adding to Bitcoin electronic trading on the stock, New York Stock Exchange, including the futures market. Both of these are tools to stabilize that coin value. Now, I want to come back and answer your question about where can I use Bitcoin? Let's not be a pound foolish here on this. The very first transaction of Bitcoin that was executed was the purchase of two pizzas. That gentleman who made that transaction in, by the way, 2010, if he would have kept those Bitcoins, that transaction cost him today, based on today's dollar, $100 million. So being short term, looking for that pizza cost him a lot. Must have been a pretty tasty pizza. I hope so. <laughs> uh, some other so, places you can yeah. buy it today. Expedia accepts Bitcoin. Cheap Air will accept Bitcoin. Overstock.com. QuickBooks, which is into it. Uh, Montessori schools, you can pay for your, 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 your education with that. Several colleges are also accepting it now. Um, Shopify. There's actually, uh, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of companies that are accepting it. We just don't hear about it yet, kind of in the United States. But in Asia, it's all over the place. So that might be a good segue point here. We talk about acceptance, but we also want to talk about the underpinning technologies of Bitcoin, which is really blockchain, yeah. and the explosive growth and use of blockchain that actually will define how successful it is, how safe it is. And it's not just for digital currency. You can sign contracts, you can trade securities or secure securities with the transactions, et cetera. So when we talk about blockchain, the underpinnings or the technologies to Bitcoin and the use of blockchain, it's going to be an epic disruption when we start talking about technology that we're going to have to deal with. And more importantly, businesses are going to have to deal with in the very near future. This isn't three or four years away. This is like now or maybe this even now. Back. It's happening right now. So, okay. so when we talk about some of those companies using, I know Starbucks is on it already. I know IBM's on it already. Um, and, and the funny thing about this is all the banks and bankers and, and trading and security houses, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and the like, Wells Fargo, they all are building blockchain infrastructures today. Yeah, it's a me too attitude right now. I mean, Satori put this thing out there and it went wild. It's been so successful that now everybody wants a piece of it. That's why we have Ethereum, Litecoin, uh, Bitcoin Gold. There's, you know, like I said, there's well over 200 of these. Uh, but by the way, you know, when you look at who's the king coin here, by market value, it's clearly Bitcoin. And by all indications, Bitcoin will probably be the surviving technology because all of these others are derivations that are focusing on speed of transaction. But if you're looking at monetization of wealth, you're not really too concerned about speed of transaction. So so let's let's talk a little bit more about the blockchain and technology itself and, and yep. why it is so disruptive and more importantly, why it's going to be a vehicle for transactions of multitude of types going forward in the future, and that future is today. So could you let us know and explain a little bit of how blockchain works? The simplest way I can say and put this is this. There is no third party, no bank, no government, no central agency involved in this transaction. If you and I agree to exchange a coin for a service, that transaction happens between you and I directly. There is no man in the middle no transaction fee, no movement fee that is occurring during this time. So nobody can really stop us from doing that either. Nobody can come in with through regulation and say, you can't pay me for that service. Of course I can. Now, think about that across borders. What does that mean to things like trans, uh, trans Union, Trans America, where we're looking at Western Union type tra transaction fees? It's going to be very disruptive for, for those businesses because you ship 100 bucks overseas today, probably costs you 10 bucks to do it and 90 bucks gets there. 
if you do it with Bitcoin or the blockchain technology, it all gets there. But Correct. there are some challenges with blockchain too, and, and I know there's some improvements coming. You know, when you transfer with Western Union, you literally can, they can handle hundreds and maybe even thousands of, of transactions a second, where blockchain today takes a little bit longer yeah. uh, to, to set that up. And I know that, um, that when you talk about it, there, there's Lightning, which is the latest version coming for blockchain. But, but we'll talk about it in a little bit of different terms. If you want to get a Bitcoin today. Today. Yep. Yeah, today. If I want to get one, I can't just go get it today if I've never had one today. I literally need to go through a setup process to get that. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jerry, and, and let, it, uh, let the audience know um, how we would go about obtaining a Bitcoin if you've never, ever had one? Well, like I said, I already pointed out that some of the uh, uh, ATMs are already uh, bought into this, and you can do it right there on the fly. But you have to have a wallet set up to, to accept that Bitcoin at that point in time. So the first thing you're going to want to do is establish a wallet and a relationship with an exchange. There are, there are over 45, under, 45 different exchanges that you can select from. Um, and you, once you lock in on that exchange, you have that wallet, you literally can, as, as simply as, as option A, fund them with a credit card, fund them with a, with a transaction of money. And that, that, and that is automatically converted into a Bitcoin. Now, you're wondering about the settlement time of how long right. it takes to create this Bitcoin. And actually, the Bitcoin settlement time is, is by far faster than what the news media has made you believe. There's actually, there's actually statistics show that it will not meet what a, what a you know, credit card agency is running, but it'll certainly meet what we're talking about here is wealth transfer. Are you willing to wait a couple of minutes for a wealth transfer? Yep. I'm probably not willing to wait a couple of minutes for buying a shoe or buying a pizza. Exactly. Right? It's, so it's, that's why we have these off-chain exchanges that have been set up. Off-chain exchanges are the man-in-the-middle kind of concept, but there's so many of them that... They're all running blockchain in between. So as we start to wrap up our discussion around Bitcoin here and, and blockchain and all this uh, new technology that's going to be disrupting our life, we want to talk just a, a moment too that when we talk about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, it's what's used in ransomware typically. And that's because it's anonymous. Nobody knows who it is and who's transacting it. And although it be it one of the positives of Bitcoin and blockchain, it's also being used on the negative side there a little bit too. Well, I think that goes without saying. <clears throat> Any form of currency can be used for nefarious purposes. Um, if anything, I guess blockchain made it easier. For it, the nefarious. It did. I mean, an ATM can be used for nefarious purposes, right? I'm go up, take right. 400 bucks out and, and give it to the local drug dealer on the street or what, somebody selling something on the gray market. Correct. And in, in ransomware today, the number one ransomware is healthcare. You, you got it. Um, last thing we want to talk about here is that nobody ever knows who founded Bitcoin, right? We, we think it's Satoshi Nakamoto, but nobody knows who he is, where he's from. And so that mystery will continue for quite some time. Although there were six people that joined him, nobody for sure to today can say that Sashi or Satoshi Nakamoto actually exists. Or is it a person or a group of persons? With that, um, this brings us to the conclusion of our show today here at the Tech Ranch. Thank you for joining us. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and give us a like or two. Take care. This is Captain Cybernet, John Nagel, signing off.